Welcome to the 2022 Lake Ponderé State of the Lake meeting. My name is Andy Ducks. I'm the Regional Fishery Manager in the Panhandle. I've worked in the region since 2008, supervising the Lake Ponderé Research Program from 2008 till 2015, before transitioning into my current role as the Regional Fishery Manager. Like many of our staff, I'm an avid angler, and that includes fishing for a variety of species in Lake Ponderé. The State of the Lake meeting has a long history. This is a public meeting that Idaho Fish and Game has held since 2005. Traditionally, this has been an in-person meeting held in the Sandpoint area. We were forced to transition to a virtual format last year because of pandemic restrictions, and we were hopeful to be back to in-person this year. As it turns out, we could have held an in-person meeting since restrictions have been lifted, but we had to make a decision about meeting format earlier this winter when it was still unclear if restrictions would be in place. We apologize for not offering the in-person format this year, as we also value the face-to-face -face interactions it provides. The silver lining of being forced into a virtual format last year is that we reached a much larger audience. Typical attendance for the in-person format has been around 100 people or so. Last year, we had over 1,000 people watch the presentation, and we were able to answer many more questions than during a typical in-person meeting. We also received a lot of positive feedback from folks about last year's presentation and virtual meeting. Because of the popularity of both meeting formats, moving forward, we plan to provide a hybrid approach where we return to an in-person meeting, but also record the presentation so that folks who cannot attend are able to watch remotely. The purpose of the State of the Lake meeting is to share information about the Lake Ponderé fishery with it being such a large water body, having so many management challenges, and having so many different elements to the fishery that are of interest to anglers, we've found it valuable to get together annually to share information, and most importantly, provide interaction between our staff and anglers. Being able to provide updates, answer questions, and hear what's on the minds of anglers has been really valuable over the years. We're going to start by providing a presentation similar to past years. If you've not participated before, You'll see that this is a lengthy presentation with a lot of detailed information about the fishery. A consistent theme over the years has been folks telling us how much they appreciate the level of information that we include in the presentation, so we're going to continue doing that again this year. Some of the background information at the beginning will be a bit repetitive from past years, but that's still important to include for folks who are participating for the first time. There will also be a lot of new information included throughout the rest of the presentation. I'm going to kick things off by giving a historical overview of the fishery and a high-level summary of the management issues and key programs in place. I'll then hand it over to Ryan Hardy, the head of the research program, and he'll provide population status for various species in the lake, along with research and monitoring plans on the lake for 2022. We'll then transition to Ken Bowens, who's the head of the VISTA-funded mitigation program, and he'll provide some project updates before handing it back to me, and I'll share with you future management direction, take home messages, along with where to look for future public outreach. We're hoping that you'll watch this presentation in advance of the live virtual meeting that we have scheduled for Tuesday, April 5th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. You can watch the presentation, come up with any questions you may have, submit those questions online, either in advance of that live meeting or during the live event, and then our staff will take turns answering questions. We'll get through as many questions as we possibly can on the evening of April 5th. We look forward to questions that you have and really encourage you to, to submit those so that we can provide some feedback. Before going any further, I'd like to acknowledge and familiarize you with the Idaho Fish and Game fishery staff who work on Lake Ponderé. Here I've listed our permanent employees who spend all or a large portion of their time working on Lake Ponderay. We've had a bit of turnover in the past year with three of our staff promoting into new jobs within the department. Ryan Hardy has stepped into the research program supervisor role formerly held by Matt Corsi and Eric Geisthart and Eli Feltz have filled vacancies at the biologist level. Collectively, we have a tremendous team of dedicated fishery professionals and their work supports the management of this fishery. The Lake Pondre fishery is the most intensively managed lake or reservoir in the state of Idaho 
and it is also one of the most intensively managed fisheries in the country. We are very fortunate to have the resources it requires to manage the fishery at the level we do. The types of programs we implement quite often aren't possible in other waters. As a result of that, I think you'll see as we continue through the presentation, the benefits from having these resources available, and ultimately the quality and diversity of fishing opportunity it allows us to provide for anglers. The work we do is made possible by funding and collaboration with other agencies and the public. I'd like to acknowledge Avista and the Bonneville Power Administration for funding they provide through hydropower mitigation programs. Most of the work we do on Lake Ponderay is funded through these two mitigation programs. We also have tremendous support from other agencies, contractors, and cooperators that allows us to implement the programs we have in place. And certainly, we value the support from anglers and other members of the public for our programs. The current Lake Ponderay fishery is diverse, offering good angling opportunity for a variety of fish species. During the last angler survey in 2014 and 15, we documented 13 different fish species were caught by anglers. Two of those were native species, bull trout and West Slope cutthroat trout, while 11 were non-native species. Of the 13 species caught, seven of those were predator species. These are fish that rely on other fish, particularly kokanee, for all or part of their diet. So with this many predators in the system, you can imagine predation management is one of our biggest challenges to sustaining the fishery. During that last angler survey, we estimated approximately 200,000 hours of angler effort. So clearly Lake Ponderay is very popular with anglers and keep in mind at the time of that last survey, the fishery was just starting to recover following collapse in the early 2000s. We'll talk later about an effort this coming year to repeat this angler survey and I fully expect to see more effort generated out there now than there was when we did the last survey. What we do know is that this is, again, a destination fishery. The fishery has clearly come surging back following collapse in the early 2000s. And we also have some additional diversity in the fishery now from other non-natives that are more prevalent. All of this opportunity combined certainly makes Ponderé one of the most socially and economically valuable fisheries in the region. Now I mentioned that Lake Ponderé currently has a very diverse fishery, but I want to drill down a bit and help you understand how angler effort is allocated among the different species. This graph shows results from that last angler, angler creel survey in 2014 and 15. For starters, I want to draw your attention to kokanee and rainbow trout. Angler effort was approximately 40% for each of these species. This means that for these two species combined, about 80% of the angler effort spent during that year targeted these two fish. Warm water fish also made up about 10% of the effort. This is bass and panfish species, while lake trout made up just under 10% of the effort. At the time, other fish species had negligible angling effort. Now, when we repeat this survey in the coming year, I expect this could look a little different. Certainly it's possible that warm water fish will make up more of the effort and in particular, walleye likely will make up more effort than they did in 2014 and 15. We'll likely also see fish like northern pike show up, which were a minor component of the fishery during the last survey. But one thing I do want to point out is we get questions at times about why we spend so much energy trying to provide a kokanee and rainbow trout fishery in the lake. And one of the big reasons for that is that we see, in this case, roughly 80% of the angler effort targeted those two species alone. And that can change a little bit from year to year, but over the course of history, we've seen these two fisheries or these two species dominate the fishery. Now that doesn't mean that we can't provide diversity and certainly warm water fishing opportunity has improved in recent years and we'll continue to try to manage for that where we can, as long as it allows for a sustainable fishery into the future. Historically, Lake Ponderay supported three native sport fish, bull trout, West Slope cutthroat trout, and mountain whitefish. Since the 1930s, the lake has supported what we refer to as the traditional Lake Ponderay fishery. This consists of native bull trout, which I'll point out are listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act throughout their range, but Lake Ponderay has the distinction of supporting one of the strongest bull trout populations in the country. 
West Slope cutthroat trout continue to be prevalent in the system. And since their establishment, non-native kokanee have really become the backbone of this fishery. Not only do they support a popular recreational fishing opportunity, but they're the primary prey source for a variety of predators in the lake. This includes native bull trout, as well as Gerard strain rainbow trout, also known as cameloops, which were introduced in the early 1940s. This is a strain of rainbow trout native to Kootenai Lake, British Columbia, that co-evolved with kokanee. And when kokanee are abundant, these fish can reach tremendous sizes. Because of the increase and in establishment of kokanee, in the 1940s, Lake Ponderé gained world-renowned status as a trophy fishery. In 1947, the former world record rainbow trout at 37 pounds was caught from the lake, and two years later, what's still the world record bull trout at 32 pounds was caught. These fish reached the sizes they got to because of an abundant kokanee food supply, and in decades since, we've seen that whenever we can support a strong kokanee population, the lake has the ability to turn out incredible trophy fish. The traditional Lake Ponderay fishery was sustainable for many years, but eventually there were factors that contributed to declines. Native bull trout and West Slope cutthroat trout suffered from tributary habitat loss and degradation, as well as negative interactions with introduced species. Beginning in the late 1960s, we started to see some declines in the kokanee population that were attributed to spawning habitat loss, hydropower operations, and negative interactions with introduced species. Despite those issues, the fishery was still sustained at a fairly high level and continued to provide good fishing opportunity through the late 1990s. But the real challenge emerged in the 2000s when the kokanee population nearly collapsed. This was primarily driven by a rapid expansion of non-native lake trout in the system, which we'll talk more about later in the presentation. As a result of the kokanee collapse, the trophy rainbow trout and bull trout fisheries suffered immensely. This was because of low kokanee abundance that resulted in much slower growth in these fish species and didn't allow them to reach trophy sizes that anglers were accustomed to. The severe decline of kokanee in the late 90s and 2000s prompted us to focus our management program on recovery of the traditional ponderay fishery. Anglers told us that they continued to value that fishery and wanted us to bring that fishery back. So we established a number of broad recovery goals. We wanted to restore a kokanee population that could support a consistent recreational harvest fishery, as well as providing a food supply to fuel the trophy fishery. We wanted to restore a consistent trophy rainbow trout fishery and maintain the strong native bull trout population, as well as try to eventually provide some limited harvest opportunity again for bull trout. Finally, we wanted to maintain the native West Slope, West Slope cutthroat trout population in the lake. Now, while we still have a little bit of work to do on some of these, it's fair to say that we've largely met these recovery goals and now have a recovered fishery. The fishery is now functioning at the highest level it has in decades, and Lake Ponderé is now generally viewed as one of the greatest fishery recovery success stories in the western U.S. This hasn't come without its challenges. There certainly were long periods of time when fishing was tough on the lake and required the patience of a lot of anglers, but it's been really rewarding to see after all that energy and investment in recovering the fishery uh, to see that translate into what's been really great fishing opportunity again on the lake. Fishing has improved greatly in Lake Ponderay over the past decade thanks to recovery of the traditional fishery. But fishing opportunity has also expanded over that time as a result of additional non-native species that have become established. One of the challenges that we deal with is determining which non-native species we can manage for and which species we need to manage against. I think this is often a source of confusion amongst anglers, so I'd like to provide some background on how we approach this. There are some non-native species that have been established for decades, such as kokanee and rainbow trout. These are species that we have observed can coexist with native species, provide expanded recreational angling opportunity, and allow us to manage for a sustainable fishery over the long term. 
The good news is that most of the non-native species that are now in the lake are largely compatible with our fishery management goals. In addition to kokanee and rainbow trout, examples include smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, panfish, brown trout, and lake whitefish. These species add recreational angling diversity to the fishery, and that's a good thing that many anglers appreciate. However, there are three non-native species in this system, lake trout, walleye, and northern pike, that are a threat to the sustainability of the fishery over the long term. As a result, we have to manage against these species. That doesn't mean these species will go away entirely. Instead, they'll likely continue to exist and provide fishing opportunity just at a low density and low catch rate. But our goal is to keep their populations at low density so they don't become abundant enough to cause problems and jeopardize sustainability of the fishery over the long run. One of our biggest challenges is managing predation levels on kokanee. Kokanee are an important food source for seven different predator species in the lake. Some of these rely more heavily on kokanee than others, but in total we have to make sure that predation doesn't exceed kokanee production. Over time, we've learned that kokanee can be sustained in the presence of several of these predators. Bull trout, rainbow trout, smallmouth bass, and brown trout all have been in the system for quite some time now, and we've been able to support kokanee in their presence. In addition, we've seen the ability to support kokanee in other systems with these predators present. The problem becomes when we add predation from other predators like lake trout. Late 90s and early 2000s, we saw lake trout increase in abundance and quickly collapsed the kokanee population because of that added predation they caused. We've seen this play out in other systems as well, and we've deemed lake trout an incompatible species when managing for a sustainable kokanee population. More recently, we've seen walleye and northern pike have an increasing presence in the system. We're still learning more about the impacts these fish are ultimately going to have, but we know from interactions these species have had in other systems that they are a threat and the added predation that they could create could jeopardize the ability to support kokanee over the long run. As a result, we've deemed lake trout, walleye, and northern pike as incompatible species in this fishery. Our goal is to manage these species at a low density. That doesn't mean they won't be there, it just means they'll be at a lower density and won't provide the same type of angling opportunity that some of these other fish do. We certainly recognize that these other species are popular with anglers. Unfortunately, we have to make these hard decisions at times in order to be able to support the fishery over the long run. It'd certainly be easier if we could just allow all of these fish, fish species to be more abundant in the lake, but that just isn't reality. And our responsibility is to manage for a sustainable fishery over the long run, particularly after having seen what things can be like when this fishery collapses and how fragile kokanee can be if predation gets out of balance. I think you can see that Lake Ponderay is an incredibly dynamic fishery. There are a lot of moving parts and pieces and there have become more of these as additional species were added to the fishery. Ultimately, this has resulted in a fishery that is increasingly complex to manage. Our job is to be responsive to all of these changes and adaptively manage the fishery to the best of our ability. We have a variety of tools in the toolbox to do this. I've listed some of those here and as we continue through the presentation, you'll see examples of how we use these tools. Well, we have a wide variety of management actions that are being implemented on the lake and I won't be able to talk about all those in the presentation, but I would like to spend a little time describing a couple of the large scale management actions that we've been implementing and that often generate angler interest. The first of these programs is lake trout suppression that's been ongoing for quite some time. And this was initiated in response to a lake trout threat that emerged in the late 1990s. We started to see a rapid expansion of the lake trout population at that time, which was a delayed response to the introduction of mysid shrimp in the late 1960s. Once these freshwater shrimp became established in the lake, it provided an abundant food source for juvenile lake trout, increased their survival rates, and ultimately allowed the lake trout population to explode in the late 1990s. Once that happened, lake trout had that added predation impact on kokanee and started to collapse their population. And we also recognized that if this continued, 
that native bull trout in the lake would be in jeopardy as well. And we'd seen this play out in a number of other systems where every time lake trout are introduced on top of native bull trout, bull trout either severely decline or even are completely extirpated. So with those things looming in our future, we had a couple of options. The first of which is we could be very proactive and initiate a lake trout suppression program to reduce their abundance. The alternative is we could do nothing. And if we did nothing, knew, we knew that the traditional fishery would collapse. And we'd seen this play out elsewhere, like in Priest Lake and Flathead Lake, where once lake trout become established, you eventually have a loss of kokanee and eventually bull trout in these systems. And so that wasn't acceptable. Anglers valued that traditional fishery and wanted us to bring that back. And so we ended up moving forward with a lake trout suppression program that aimed to reduce the lake trout population to its late 90s abundance before they became problematic and then maintain the population at that low density into the future. We initiated a lake trout suppression program that had two primary components. First, we contracted with a commercial fishing company, Hickey Brothers Research, from the Great Lakes region that had tremendous expertise operating commercial scale gears and a history of fishing for lake trout in the Great Lakes. We also added what we call the Angler Incentive Program, where we paid anglers $15 per fish to remove lake trout. Together, these two things were implemented beginning in 2006 and have been continued since. This work is funded using our Avista and BPA mitigation programs. And we've coupled the suppression work with research and monitoring, doing things like telemetry, where we put transmitters in fish to understand their distribution. For example, we were able to identify spawning areas within the lake where we could go target these fish with nets so that we could maximize our efficiency and minimize the impact we'd have on other species. We also did things like population estimates so that we could monitor changes in the population and our, our effectiveness of suppression over time, along with a variety of other research and monitoring work. In order to be effective at removing lake trout in a water body the size of Lake Ponderay, it requires using large scale fishing gear. This is exactly the reason why we contracted with a commercial netting company that has expertise and the equipment to operate gears out of large boats with mechanical net lifters and able to set thousands of feet of net per day so that we can cover enough ground and catch enough fish to make this worthwhile. In past years, we've used some deep water trap nets, but in recent years, we've moved exclusively to gill nets as the tool for removing lake trout from the lake. We have a lake trout netting strategy that has two primary components. First of which is targeting mature adult lake trout in the fall at spawning areas. Lake trout aggregate in the fall to spawn and we've used telemetry to identify the locations where these fish spawn within the lake. The three open circles on the map show the areas that lake trout generally spawn in a given year and we're able to target fish with nets at those locations. We also target juvenile lake trout by netting in what we call nursery areas that are indicated by the gray shaded circles. These are relatively shallower portions of the lake where juvenile lake trout are more effective at feeding on mice or shrimp. Their concentration in these areas allow us to target them with smaller mesh nets and maximize our efficiency. This netting strategy not only allows us to be most effective at removing lake trout, but it also allows us to net in more localized areas so that we minimize the impact we have on other fish species in the lake. This graph shows the number of lake trout removed since the suppression program began in 2006. The black portion of each bar shows the number of fish removed by anglers, while the gray portion of the bars shows the number of fish removed from suppression netting. There are also were a few fish removed in recent years from assessment netting, which is work we do to monitor trends in the population. With all methods combined, we've now removed well over 200,000 lake trout since the program began. An important part that's shown in this, in this graph is that both methods are working in tandem to maximize our efficiency. Had we only used netting or angling, it would have been more difficult to achieve the success that we've seen so far. 
but with both tools working in tandem, it's proven very effective. Later in the presentation, Ryan will talk more specifically about the effect that these removals have had on the overall lake trout population. Another benefit of using multiple removal methods is that it allows us to target all size classes of fish in the population. Our netting strategy that targets juvenile lake trout in nursery areas and adult lake trout at spawning sites allows us to target the smallest and largest fish in the population, while the Angler Incentive Program is most effective at removing the intermediate size fish in the population. Together, this allows us to target all of those size classes effectively. Another thing I'll point out here is that the Angler Incentive Program is now being driven by lots of anglers turning in a few heads per angler each year. It's more difficult to target lake trout than it used to be, but the incentive still motivates anglers who incidentally catch lake trout while fishing for other species to turn those fish in, and collectively this is still helping to maintain harvest effort on lake trout. Something we have to contend with in the lake trout netting program is bycatch. When I say bycatch, I'm referring to species other than lake trout that we unintentionally catch in the nets. We go to great lengths to avoid bycatch, however some amount of it is inevitable. Over the years, we've been able to refine our netting techniques and we do a lot of different things to minimize the impact we have on these non-target species. This includes things like setting nets in places where we know lake trout are most abundant and have the least overlap with non-target species. Similarly, we avoid netting in areas where we know lake trout are present, but where there's a high amount of overlap with these other species. Another big thing that we do is we set our nets for short durations, only allowing them to fish for several hours before checking them. And this results in higher survival of fish that do get caught in the nets unintentionally and allows us to release a high percentage of those fish alive. In contrast, gill nets can be fished overnight or for multiple days at a time, and in those instances, mortality can be quite high. So we've been able to modify our practices so that we have higher survival on those non-target fish. The graph I've shown here is just a typical year of bycatch from the lake trout netting program. This is the kind of bycatch we see year over year in the program. And in addition to removing lake trout, there really are three primary species that we see in the nets. Lake whitefish, which we catch the most of. In fact, so many we don't count every fish that comes on board the boat. But over the years, we've not seen a notable decline in lake whitefish. And we also release the majority of these fish that we catch alive. We do encounter some kokanee and bull trout as well. Again, most of these are released alive and the mortalities are very small relative to the population size. For all other species, we see very few of these in the lake trout netting program. And again, most can be released alive. I will point out that the lake trout that we catch and remove go to local food banks so that those fish are not wasted. Although we were able to successfully recover the fishery following the collapse caused by lake trout, we now have a new threat to sustaining the fishery into the future from a growing walleye population. In the 1990s, walleye were illegally introduced to Montana. They eventually dispersed downstream through the Clark Fork, and by the early 2000s, we had documented them in Idaho Fish and Game surveys. In 2009, we documented the first large year class in the lake, and in 2011, we began standards population monitoring surveys that are conducted every three years. From 2011 to 2017, we saw the walleye population grow exponentially, and we were concerned that if left unchecked, the population would continue to increase at that rate. In 2018, we began a pilot walleye suppression program, and when we repeated the population survey in 2020, we saw the first evidence of decline in this population, which looks to be a response to the suppression work that was initiated. Later in the talk, Ryan will get into some of the details of the response we've seen in the walleye population, and I'm just going to continue to provide a little background about this threat at this point in the presentation. There are a number of reasons why we're concerned about the impacts walleye may have in Lake Ponderay, and they're all rooted in walleye biology. Walleye thrive in new environments, they're highly effective predators, especially in systems with trout, kokanee, and soft rayed fish. They typically have a diverse diet and can easily switch prey, being opportunistic predators. They mature early and have a high reproductive potential, so these things allow their populations to grow quickly. 
They're able to spawn in a variety of habitat types, and they're fairly long-lived, commonly living 10 to 20 years or more. All of these things make walleye well-suited to be an effective predator in the Ponderay system, which could challenge our ability to support a kokanee population, as well as the predation that may result on fish we're managing for, such as bull trout, rainbow trout, and cutthroat trout. And finally, there's potential for walleye to compete for prey with other species such as smallmouth bass in the system that are popular with anglers and that we're trying to provide opportunity for. The challenges that introduced walleye pose to a fishery are not unique to Lake Ponderay. Walleye introductions have been widespread throughout the western U.S. in recent decades. Because this is not a new issue, it does provide an advantage in that we can look at other systems to see how they've responded following the establishment of walleye. This gives us a better idea what we might expect to see in Lake Ponderay if they continue to increase in abundance. Now there certainly have been some benefits to having walleye in western waters, mainly that they're a popular sport fish that anglers really enjoy to pursue, and they're certainly a great tasting fish that anglers like to harvest. They also add diversity to western fisheries that typically are dominated by cold water species. However, there's typically some problems that follow the introduction of walleye, mainly that it's difficult to sustain popular, popular recreational fisheries after walleye are established. And this is particularly the case for fisheries that are supported by wild production rather than hatchery production, which is the case in Lake Ponderay for most of the species we manage for. While they've had notable impacts to native species in western waters, and they also make it difficult to sustain a prey base over the long term, particularly fish like kokanee. As a result of these things, we expect that walleye will present challenges over the long term if they're allowed to increase in abundance in this system. Before making any decisions about how to manage walleye in the Lake Ponderay system, we wanted to consult with some outside experts. So back in 2018, we convened what we call the Walleye Summit. We brought in five outside walleye experts from the Midwest and Canada. Now, although our fish and game team has a lot of collective experience working with walleye, we wanted to get some additional input from folks who are noted walleye experts from other parts of the country. We shared information with this group of folks and discussed some of the options we thought we had moving forward. They helped us to both identify research questions that we should try to answer moving forward and also helped us work through a decision about whether or not we needed to implement a walleye suppression program. Ultimately, we arrived at several different questions that we needed to tackle. For instance, monitoring the walleye population trend over time, better understanding their distribution, diet, and reproduction in the system, and ultimately, the group unanimously agreed that we needed to evaluate whether or not suppression of walleye could be effective. They also recommended that we start that evaluation immediately because if we waited, walleye had the potential to start growing even more rapidly and it could be difficult to rein this population back in if it got too far ahead of us. So following this recommendation, we implemented a pilot suppression program for walleye. The first component of this was a spring gill netting program that began in 2018. This was done over a 15-day period in April and May and has continued each year since. The goal is to target pre-spawning and spawning aggregations of walleye that we've identified by using telemetry. We then use short duration net sets, letting nets only fish for several hours so that we have minimal mortality to non-target species that encounter the nets. The walleye that are caught in the nets are removed from the lake and distributed to food banks in the community. We added another component to the suppression program in 2019, adding an angler incentive program, much like we've done for lake trout. Although we structured this program a little differently, where we implanted tags in the heads of walleye and released them into the lake. Anglers then catch the walleye. They have no idea if a fish is carrying a tag, but if they turn heads from their walleye into freezer locations around the lake, we'll scan them for tags and any fish that's carrying a tag will result in a thousand dollar reward to that angler. In addition, we conduct monthly drawings, giving out 10 $100 rewards per month. An angler gets their name in the drawing for each head that they turn in that month. In 
To give you a better sense for the scale of our walleye suppression netting relative to lake trout suppression netting, I put together this map. The blue dots on the map represent the locations where we netted for lake trout in a given year. And the orange dots represent locations where we netted for walleye in the same year. So what you'll see is the number of netting locations for lake trout is far greater than for walleye and it's more widespread throughout the lake and occurs over a much longer time period. Walleye netting is primarily focused in and around the mouth of the Pack River Delta with some other net sets occurring on the north end of the lake, but it only occurs over a 15 day window in the spring and it's very localized relative to what we do for lake trout. Overall, the amount of netting effort that we have for lake trout is nine times higher than what we do for walleye. Now I show this because I think at times folks have perceived that our walleye netting program occurs over a far greater time period and over a far greater area than it actually does. This is actually a very small scale program, particularly relative to what we're doing for lake trout in the system. Well, that concludes the first major section of the presentation. So at this point, I'm going to transition to Ryan Hardy. He'll introduce himself and then provide population status updates for various species, along with research and monitoring plans for 2021. Hi, my name is Ryan Hardy. I'm the principal fishery research biologist on the Lake Pondery Research Program. And as a native Idahoan, I've grown up enjoying fishing in and around Pondery Lake. My section covers the latest in species status updates and fishery science on Lake Pondery. So I'll jump right into our status updates for several species in the lake. I do again want to thank our group of dedicated biologists that put a tremendous amount of hard work into collecting the data and developing the metrics that I'm about to describe. And those metrics are what we use to manage the Lake Pondere fishery. So I'll start out with the kokanee update because kokanee are the cornerstone of the Lake Pondere fishery. For kokanee population assessments, we use these three tools in concert to understand age-specific trends in abundance. Hydroacoustics give us total abundance and our sample from trawling allows us to break up the hydroacoustics data into age classes. As far as our monitoring program goes, I want to start out with fry abundance. To orient you to this figure, the black bar on the left here is the average abundance of fry prior to the closure of the fishery in 2000. The red dashed line is the average from 2000 to 2020. As you can see, fry abundance in 2021, this past year, is above the average from the last 20 years, which is sufficient to fully seed the lake. Now I want to show everyone a look at the total abundance of kokanee older than fry over the last couple of years. Evaluating total abundance tells us what is available for predatory fishes in the lake. Our surveys show that we continue to see high levels of kokanee abundance in 2021, and we are sustaining a strong enough population to support a predator species and a kokanee fishery. This is good news because we are in a better situation than we were in years like 2019 when we had very high abundances which resulted in smaller kokanee and really didn't support a good fishery. One key thing to remember, however, is that although high kokanee abundances are not so good for kokanee fisheries, those years create phenomenal conditions for growth of critters like Gerard rainbow trout and bull trout and several other species in the lake that utilize kokanee for at least some of their diet. So how was the fishing for kokanee in 2021? For those that went out and tried, it was pretty good and the size was better than it was for several years prior as evident from this photo that was taken from an angler last year of a nice day's catch. Part of this was the fact that length and weight of the average fish rebounded some to go along with those higher abundances. In this figure, the orange line is the trend in weight, and the blue line is the trend in length of an age 3 kokanee, which is the typical age at which Lake Pondere kokanee mature. The red line represents a 10-inch fish, which is a good goal for the fishery. As you can see, we've seen some small kokanee in the system, especially from 2017 through 2020. And as I mentioned before, abundant small fish are great for predators to eat, but obviously less desirable to fishermen. We saw the average size improve last year in 2021, and we do expect it to be at least as good and likely a bit better in 2022. 
So fishermen should be optimistic that this next year will offer good kokanee fishing with both good catch rates and fish size. Another way we evaluate kokanee is by evaluating the total biomass, which is essentially the total weight of all the kokanee in the lake combined. This influences how much food is available for kokanee predators. For a little more than a decade, biomass was on a concerning downward trend, as you can see here in the figure. Through our research program, we've determined that the primary reason for this was that predation of kokanee exceeded the new biomass that was produced every year. And that is a recipe for fishery collapse. In 2026, we began removing those predators and kokanee biomass started to respond immediately. But in 2011 and 2012, another major shift occurred in the system when the mysis shrimp population collapsed. Although we don't know the reason for this collapse, this phenomenon was observed to a greater or lesser degree in several other systems throughout the region. Mysis shrimp were introduced into Lake Pondere in the late 1960s with strong public support in hopes that they would be an abundant food source for kokanee. Unfortunately, this was not the case and they wound up as a great food source for juvenile lake trout and they competed with kokanee for zooplankton. And after the mysis collapsed, we saw kokanee biomass go to an entirely new level that hasn't been observed in decades. This is a new era of kokanee production and is a very good thing for growth of all species that consume kokanee. Now I will switch over to talk about one of those species that benefits from abundant kokanee and that is the rainbow trout. Directly measuring rainbow abundance is very difficult because these critters occupy offshore habitat and they spawn at or near spring runoff. But we can monitor growth and angler catch statistics of these fish as an opportunity to keep our finger on the pulse of their performance. To inform us on catch statistics of this important fishery, we are using completed angler logbook information which provides us with extremely valuable data outside of implementing system-wide creel surveys. Over time, however, we were seeing fewer logbooks being turned in, so this past year we put a fair amount of effort into reaching out to fishermen to garner more support for the program and to obtain more completed logbooks. Instead of asking anglers to fill out logbooks all year long like we did in years past, we made it easier by just asking for logbooks to be filled out during two separate week-long windows in November that coincided with the main fishing derbies that were also occurring on the lake. We then incentivized the return of these books by entering participants into a raffle to win various prizes. As a result, we had a good increase in completed logbooks returned, and we're hoping that as we continue, participation will also continue to increase. We'll continue this program in the fall, so please consider participating. This is essentially an angler-driven data collection program. This photo is an example of one of our angler logbooks. We provide data sheets to record fishing data like hours and number of rods fished, number of fish caught, kept or released, and other valuable information. The logbooks provide us with an idea of the average length and weight of a fish that they're catching, along with rough estimates of catch rates without having to do a full-blown creel survey. If we do this in a standardized manner every year, it provides very informative trend information. Some anglers have also collected fin rays for us as well, and we use these fin rays to estimate the age of a fish, like using rings on a tree. Further, we can also tell how fast a fish is growing, not just in the current year, but in all years of that fish's life. Growth rate data are a critical tool for us to evaluate the performance of the fishery because rainbow trout growth changes depending on the abundance of rainbows relative to the abundance of kokanee in the system. To highlight the importance of kokanee to rainbow trout growth, I'll show you these data. Where we have the relationship of rainbow trout annual growth here on the y-axis as a function of the abundance of kokanee here on the x-axis down below. This analysis demonstrates that as kokanee abundance increases, so does the amount of additional growth in rainbow trout. The way you can think about it is that for every additional two and a half million kokanee we have in the lake, we see an additional half an inch of annual growth in adult rainbow trout per year beyond their normal growth. And as trophy anglers already know, adding bonus inches is adding bonus pounds to these fish. To show that a different way, 
In 2011, when kokanee biomass was lower than it is now, it took rainbow trout about six years to hit 24 inches in length. It now takes rainbow trout only around four and a half years to hit 24 inches. And under recent conditions, a six-year-old rainbow trout is already exceeding 28 inches. This was very apparent by some of the information that we received this past year, like this angler that turned in this derby winning fish at nearly 32 pounds and 39 inches in length. We were fortunate enough that the angler allowed us to pull aging structures from this fish and we aged it at seven years old. This is tremendously fast growth and demonstrates how good the growing conditions are for rainbow trout right now. This additional growth is paying dividends in the fishery. This figure shows the trend in rainbow trout sizes from data collected in the angler logbook program. Fish larger than 30 inches made up about 4% of the catch in 2016, but as you can see, they've increased now to where they're over 16% of the catch in 2021. And even better, the proportion of the catch 33 inches or better went up from around 1% just a few years ago to now over 4% this past year. To add to that, although the net boat only captures a fairly small number of rainbows, we are steadily seeing an increase of all size classes in our spawner index sampling over time. We are also seeing this increase in rainbows over 30 inches as suppression netting has taken place. This trend suggests that the number of rainbow trout in the population is likely increasing and as I mentioned earlier, we are using angler logbook information to inform us how these fish are showing up in the fishery. As another example of improved rainbow trout growth, we work with Lake Ponderay Idaho Club to collect information on the number of patch fish. Patches are a special award given by the club to anglers that catch 25 pound fish in Lake Ponderay. If you look here in the early 1990s, there was a great run of these tremendous 25 pound rainbows caught every year. But then there was a long drought, and as kokanee abundance dried up, so did the number of patch fish. We now see this fishery has recovered its top end trophy status, as there is an increasing trend in the number of patch fish that have been awarded in the last several years. In 2021, 11 patches were awarded, which is the fourth highest number in the past 45 years. Before I move on to the status updates for other species, I wanted to reiterate that although rainbow trout are one of the premier fishing opportunities that the lake has to offer, we are somewhat limited in our ability to use typical research gear and we do need angler help to monitor the fishery. We'll continue to work with anglers by gathering fin rays from tournament fish as well as angler collections. We'll also continue to collaborate with anglers on the logbook program. We'd love more participation in this program. It's a great opportunity for you to give back to the fishery and help us manage and conserve this incredible resource. Finally, we did start a Floyd tag study in 2021 and that will continue at least through this year. We currently have around 300 rainbows tagged with these orange tags. If you catch one of these fish, please report the tag fish do not have to be harvested to report the tag. Tags can be clipped off or the tag can be number can be recorded or a photo taken of it and the fish released with the tag still in the fish. If you catch a fish with a reward tag the dollar amount will be listed on the tag. These tags must be removed from the fish and mailed to Fish and Game to claim the reward whether the angler harvests the fish or not. I'll switch gears now and talk just a minute about bull trout. Although they are listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act, Lake Ponderay supports one of the strongest populations in the country. While we don't currently allow a harvest opportunity for bull trout in this system, they do add diversity to the fishery in the form of an outstanding catch and release fishery for a native fish that reaches trophy sizes. In fact, Ponderay produced a new catch and release record bull trout last year at 39 inches, which unofficially weighed about 31 pounds. This fish was within a pound of the current world record caught from the lake in 1949. As with rainbow trout, these fish can reach tremendous size when there is an abundant kokanee food supply. 
Although we still use red counts or the number of spawning beds created by adults as an index of abundance, we are now able to take full advantage of the fact that we can tag every bull trout we catch and release in our netting operation. Every bull trout we catch and release is tagged with a very small passive integrated transponder or pit tag, which is the same electronic tag technology used to evaluate salmon and steelhead fisheries. Being able to tag hundreds of bull trout annually during the netting operations really increases our ability to monitor bull trout. In addition, our tributary monitoring program and Avista programs in Montana also tag bull trout as juveniles. After collecting multiple years of data, we are now able to integrate our red count data with survival data from pit tags to estimate abundance of multiple life stages in the fishery. The outcome of this analysis shows us that the trend in juvenile abundance shown in the left figure and the trend in adult abundance as seen in the right figure bounce around from year to year depending on the number of successful spawners or other environmental factors. But in general, the population is quite stable with the number of adults hovering around 4,000 fish over the long term. These are results of the model through 2018 and we will be updating this model in the coming year. And as I mentioned, red counts are also a means of evaluating bull trout abundance trends in this system. Although there are various conditions that can influence counts in any individual year, we continue to see a strong and stable population of bull trout in the system since 2018. Okay, now we'll transition to our evaluation and monitoring of some of the threats to the sustainability of the Lake Ponderé fishery namely lake trout, walleye, and mysa shrimp. We'll start with lake trout. We now have a long history of aggressively managing this species, and that management has paid dividends in terms of the quality of the fishing in Lake Ponderé. As Andy mentioned earlier, we have now removed well over 275,000 lake trout to date. And we are seeing this translate into a steady decrease in the total abundance in the lake. This figure shows the trend in estimated abundance of spawning aged lake trout in Lake Ponderé through 2019. This model will be updated in 2022 with the most current age structure and survival estimates. As you can see in the figure, the abundance of adults peaked in 2005 and because of the netting efforts we've seen a greater than 80% decline in the abundance since that time. I'll now take just a moment to show some catch rates of lake trout in our netting program to make a point about why we have to stay vigilant and maintain netting effort. The trend in spawner catch rates is in the figure on the left and the catch rate of our small mesh or nursery netting is on the right here. Note the recent small bumps in catch rates of small fish. This indicates that there may be periods where conditions for lake trout recruitment were good over the past several years. We've seen these types of bumps and catch before and it isn't too much to worry about because we have heavy pressure on these fish as they grow and before they are spawning adults, as evident in the declining trend of adult catch rates over time. However, if we had backed off netting effort, then this may have resulted in a larger bump in numbers of small fish. Another thing that I would like to mention is some upcoming research that we are doing. As many folks may remember, one of the tools we used at the start of the program was to use telemetry to guide netting efforts. Now that we've driven the population to such a low level, we are no longer detecting large spawning aggregations as we once did. To assure that we are maximizing our efficiency, we recently acoustically tagged a number of adult lake trout of spawning size to assure that we're maximizing the efficiency in our spawner netting efforts. Now I'll move from lake trout to spend some time updating you all on walleye. Because we are still in the learning phase of walleye management, ecology, and suppression in Lake Ponderé, this is a focus of our research projects right now. Walleye can make it really difficult to manage a fishery, especially a salmonid-based fishery, if they are left to their own devices. Just to remind everyone, we are focusing research on walleye in Lake Ponderé and from Cabinet Gorge Dam on the Clark Fork River to Albany Falls Dam on the Ponderay River. 
My purpose today is to give a progress report on the suppression program. I'll start by describing the number, location, size, structure, and sex ratio of removals. In addition, I'll spend some time discussing what we've learned about the distribution and movement. As Andy indicated earlier, our observation in the 2020 Fall Walleye Index Netting Survey was, in fact, very encouraging and suggested that the population had declined to densities similar to those observed in 2014. This represented a 48% decline in mean density from 2017, and the 2020 point estimate is 65% less than what we hypothesized it would be if the population continued growing. This is great news, and it's strong indication that the suppression program is working. To date, the suppression program has resulted in the removal of more than 6,800 walleyes since 2018. Catch rates in the spring suppression netting have declined each year of the program, but angler removals have remained stable. We believe angler contributions have held up, because of the incentives that have been offered, as well as the fact that we are putting out blogs with maps identifying the locations of acoustically tagged walleye throughout the lake and rivers. This allows anglers to better target walleye. Overall, total removals have averaged 1,700 fish per year from netting and angling. So what about size structure? Both components of the program have been effective at removing subadult and adult walleye, including some very large fish. The average fish removed from both of these programs is pretty large, around 20 to 22 inches, and anglers are successful at catching and turning in fish even up to 30 plus inches. This is in contrast to the lake trout program where anglers are essentially removing a size of fish that we are less effective at targeting with our nets. In the case of walleye, anglers are putting a good dent in the adult population where removals matter the most for population control. These large fish caught in both the netting and angling are characteristic of a population of walleye with very rapid growth rates. Fast growth in walleye, especially at this latitude, generally occurs in populations that are at a low to moderate density. And by keeping walleye at low density, it is likely helping walleye achieve desirable and even trophy sizes very rapidly relative to other regional waters where walleye populations have reached high densities and growth is now slower. I wanted to take a quick second to highlight some of the other results of the Angler Incentive Program since it began in 2019. About 160 anglers have participated every year. To date, 16 coated wire tagged fish have been returned for $1,000 rewards. The program has paid out $28,000 in monthly drawings and $34,000 in total. Our program works to keep coated wire tags in at least 100 fish at any one time, and this past year, six tags were returned by anglers. Many folks are interested in bycatch issues with gillnet suppression programs. This tends to be a hot button issue for some anglers. This figure lumps data from across all years of the netting program. The take home messages here are that because nets are set for a short period of time, in select locations, we are able to keep our catch focused on target species, which in this case is walleye. Another thing to consider and be aware of is that even though we catch a lot of smallmouth bass, they almost never die in our short set nets because they are hardy and don't wedge in gill nets very easily. In fact, most of the mortalities we see in the suppression netting are direct results of intentional removal opportunities for walleye, lake trout, and northern pike, which are all species we are managing against. Also, we see that there are hardly any bull trout mortalities in spring walleye netting. I also wanted to mention a bit about sex ratios in our suppression netting. Male walleye tend to stage at or near spawning shoals and females show up when they are ready to spawn. As such, we had some concerns that targeted spawner netting might actually present some challenges for removals of female walleye, which are an important component of the population for impacting growth rate. We did observe very large catches of male walleye in 2018, particularly in some locations, 
but sex ratios from 2019 to 2021 were hovering around that 50-50 mark, which is quite encouraging for a suppression netting program because it means many females are being removed and limiting reproduction. Switching gears to looking at the spatial distribution of removals, we'll start with the Angler Incentive Program. Angler harvest has been broadly distributed across the Clark Fork River, the northern basin of the lake, and the Pondre River. Although anglers have caught and removed a few fish from the southern basin of the lake, the bulk of the walleye action occurs at the northern parts, from the Cabinet Gorge Dam on the Clark Fork River to Albany Falls Dam on the Pondre River. And these results are consistent with what we've seen from the telemetry as well. In contrast to the Angler Incentive Program, the vast majority of removals via netting are occurring in the northern basin of the lake, with the majority of removals coming just from the two areas indicated on the map. The remaining portion of walleye removed came from various locations primarily along the northern shoreline of the lake. And at this point, anglers are doing all of the suppression in the Clark Fork and Ponderay rivers. So it does look like our removals are having a lake-wide impact, but this all requires further monitoring. For example, netting doesn't currently impact fish spawning in the Clark Fork River. Furthermore, it is too early to understand the interplay between suppression and other drivers of recruitment and walleye. But the work in other walleye fisheries does suggest high exploitation on the spawning population, particularly large females, can reduce the frequency of large year classes that lead to population explosions. And finally, one other thing that we would like to gain understanding on is how many walleye are entering the system from Montana. I also wanted to take a second here to remind folks that when we remove these fish, they do not get wasted. We collect a tremendous amount of information from these fish to help us understand how to best manage them. For example, we collect structures for age and growth analysis. We have also been involved in collecting stomach contents and tissue samples for food habit evaluations. Additionally, we look at population parameters like fecundity or the number of eggs in a female and spawn timing for population modeling. And finally, we are also involved in looking at structures to determine the water body of origin based on microchemistry. And when we are all done with that, we clean the fish and get them to the local food bank charities, providing thousands of pounds of fish to folks in need. Now I'll talk a bit about what we've learned about walleye distribution through our telemetry program. We have built up a sample of about 50 at-large walleyes that are implanted with acoustic tags that allow us to assess habitat use and timing. These tag locations are recorded on remote receivers that are distributed throughout the lake in addition to active tracking that is also occurring by our staff. In the last couple of years, we've added depth recording tags into our toolbox. This has actually been a great addition because it allows us to now not only know what point on the map this fish is using, but it also tells us what depth the fish is using in that particular habitat which is important in a system like Pond Ray where food resources vary greatly by depth. So to give you an idea of what we were seeing in a broad context of distribution, I pulled this figure together to describe where most of our telemetry detections are occurring. You can see on the map to the left the various areas that we refer to as strata which number from 1 to 5. It is very clear that throughout the year we get good amount of detections at the Clark Fork River and delta in strata 4. One thing to consider, however, is that we also have exceptional detection rate in these locations by our receivers, so that also plays a part in some of this. Currently, we have less effective detection rates in the shallow western basin of the lake, but we expect that this has been rectified for the 2021 movement analysis with the addition of more receivers. We also observed high use of the Pondre River during the summer months. The take home message here is to reinforce that while walleye are using all areas of the lake, the northern shoreline from the dam to dam is the hot zone for walleye activity. From our telemetry, we have seen that walleye are highly mobile, especially in the fall from September through November when the average fish is moving 15 to 20 miles per week. These fish are likely trying to bulk up for winter. 
Conversely, movement is lowest in the spring when fish are concentrating for spawning. Now let's talk about depth. We'll look at that a couple of ways. First by evaluating average depth used by these fish, then by looking at maximum depths observed. The idea being that walleye will often hang out at a preferred depth, but make forays into other habitats to forage. Each of these colored lines in the figure to the right is an average depth used by fish in each of these sections of the lake. Patterns across times and seasons are notably consistent, where fish are using deeper habitats during the late fall and winter and spending most of their time in pretty shallow water during the spring and summer. For reference, two meters is about six and a half feet. We end up getting a clearer picture of the full range of habitats utilized by these fish, however, when we evaluate maximum depths used by tagged walleyes. Even though these fish spend most of their time in shallower waters, they are making frequent trips to deeper water. Note that even during the summer, when the average depth is only six and a half feet, we observe fish using depths up to 100 and even 147 feet. I also want to be sure to let everyone know that starting mid-April, we will once again be putting out periodic updates on the Idaho Fishing Game website to discuss the latest telemetry findings, as well as provide a map of the latest unique walleye detections associated with all of the remote receivers we have in the lake. We have received positive feedback that anglers appreciate having this information, and we will continue to do this for the 2022 season. And now for some take-home messages for walleye. First, it appears that, for now, suppression efforts are working to keep the population in check and numbers at a manageable level. However, we must stay vigilant to prevent those large recruitment events. Next, anglers are removing a good number of fish, which is helping in this management. And it is very evident that there is plenty of fishing opportunity to be involved in and the chance to win prizes. From our evaluations, it is also evident that walleye do use the entire lake. However, the majority continue to be concentrated at the north end, and those that we are tracking seem to be using shallow nearshore habitats the majority of the year, but are by no means limited to those depths. A side benefit of the walleye netting program is that it has allowed us to tag smallmouth bass that we catch to better evaluate their population status. Smallmouth produce a phenomenal fishery in the lake and they have been largely compatible with a sustainable fishery. We began a tagging study last year in an effort to add to our understanding of angler use and harvest of this population through tag returns. We currently have over 300 smallmouth tagged with Floyd tags, and as you can see, we have a good representation of size classes, even between 16 and 20 inches. For reference in the figure on the right, 16 inches is around 406 millimeters on the x-axis. So as with Floyd tags in rainbow trout, if you see one in a smallmouth, please report it, and if it is a reward tag, the tag needs to be removed for it to be valid. Okay, for our final species update, I will let you know about the status of mysis shrimp in the system. Mysis have the ability, when highly abundant, to limit food availability for kokanee, which in turn has negative ramifications for all of those apex predators in the lake. We keep a close eye on mysis because they have the potential to have a large impact on our flexibility for managing for a diversity of predators in the lake. Just to recap one more time about the background of mysids, they were introduced into the lake in the 1960s and became well established by 1975. They were introduced into the lake in the hopes that they would be an abundant food source for kokanee. Unfortunately, this was not the case and they wound up as a great food source for juvenile lake trout and competing with kokanee for zooplankton. Okay, I'll cut right to the chase. As of 2020, mysis abundance were still at a low density in the system due to their apparent crash starting in 2012, which was a very good thing for kokanee, the growth of all those predatory fish species, as well as the overall fisheries in general. The 2020 mysid densities were around 40% of the 95 to 2011 trend, so things were optimal for kokanee production. 
Fast forward to 2021, we saw a much higher average density than previous estimates, actually over double from the last year and the highest since the population collapsed in 2011 to 2012. This is a concern and something that we will be watching closely moving forward. We've been fortunate to have fewer mysis in the system for nearly a decade, and this has benefited kokanee. We expect that a fairly strong kokanee population can be sustained with more mysis present. However, the lake won't be able to support as many kokanee if mysis stay at a higher density into the future. This will give us less margin for error in terms of providing enough kokanee to support predator populations and a good kokanee fishery. Now that I've gone through those species status updates for you, I want to take a minute, as we did in last year's State of the Lake meeting, and bring all of that information together for you to describe to you how we as managers have to think about this fishery. Lake Pondere and the fish that make up its diverse and excellent fisheries are part of a dynamic food web and all of these species are interrelated. So let's take all of what I've told you about the status of these species and put it all into context. Back in 2008, kokanee were on the verge of collapse. We were in the early stages of the lake trout suppression program, so the lake trout were still highly abundant. At that time, mysis shrimp were also very abundant and these shrimp compete with kokanee for a food resource. The size of the blue oval here represents the amount of food available to kokanee as determined by mysis abundance. Now fast forward to 2013. The lake trout suppression program has been highly successful and the predation pressure on kokanee was reduced. In addition, the mysis population collapsed and again we do not know the exact reason why allowing for a greater food availability and good kokanee growth as well as high kokanee abundances. By 2017, mysis abundance was still down but it rebounded some. Food availability for kokanee was reduced some but those larger abundant kokanee created very strong year classes of highly abundant young. As a result of high kokanee abundance and reduced food availability, Lake Pondere was filled with highly abundant but small kokanee. These kokanee were too small to create fishing opportunity, but they made tremendous forage for trophy Gerard strain rainbow trout and native bull trout in the lake. So where does this leave us now? Kokanee abundance has declined some to match their food availability and size has improved a bit. From a kokanee fishing standpoint, things have improved from where they were at in 2017 to 2020, now offering good catch rates for fish typically in that 9 to 11 inch range. And kokanee are still abundant enough to provide a strong prey base for predators like rainbow trout and bull trout. And this is a good place to be, but these aren't the only mouths to feed out there. We still have lake trout at slightly higher abundances than in the mid 1990s. We have a population of walleye and northern pike in the system. We have a tremendous smallmouth fishery in the lake, which takes advantage of kokanee when they are available and we even grow some trophy brown trout that depend on kokanee prey. Right now it seems as if there may be enough food to go around for all these predators, but it is a delicate balance. So what does the future hold? Well, some of that depends on whether mysis continue to be at a higher density. We don't know what caused mysis to decline, and we don't know if the higher density in 21 will persist. If it does, it could reduce carrying capacity of kokanee. And regardless how it plays out, we do know that kokanee tend to cycle up and down. If kokanee are cycling down when the lake is filled with large long-lived predators, it puts us at risk of the kokanee population declining again. If that happens, the trophy potential and abundance of all these species would suffer, and we'd lose that characteristic of the Lake Pondere fishery that makes it so special. As a result, it will be important that we continue to manage for low densities of the three incompatible species. By doing this, it will maximize the likelihood that we can maintain balance between the kokanee food supply and predation in the lake. 
Okay, we're coming to the end of the research portion of our meeting, so I'll quickly summarize some of the take-home messages from my portion of the presentation. First, the kokanee population remains robust. They provide an excellent opportunity for a fishery, and there are indications that the size will remain good for the 2022 season. Next, the rainbow trout fishery is now producing trophy-sized fish due to this abundant kokanee population and is showing excellent growth rates. The bull trout population also shows to be robust, and our modeling will allow us to ask some specific questions about managing those populations into the future. After a prolonged low density time period, mysis shrimp are showing signs of an increase, and we should all be aware that this has the potential to affect kokanee into the future, and we'll just have to wait and see how this all plays out. And finally, I want to point out that suppression is working for lake trout and walleye in the system. It is creating a fishery that is strong lake-wide because of netting and not in spite of it. Now I want to mention some plans for what we have coming in the research program. For starters, we will be keeping up our standard monitoring for kokanee, lake trout, rainbow trout, and other fish species. We will also be conducting a creel survey for 2022 to help us better understand how effort and catch rates are distributed, as well as other key findings about the Lake Ponderé and Ponderé River fisheries. This year we will also continue a rainbow trout and smallmouth bass tagging study. This will provide us with an idea of angler use, harvest, and we can combine those data with the creel survey data to gain a better understanding of those fisheries. We will also be maintaining a focus on telemetry in this program particularly on walleye. We want to be able to provide that information to anglers so they can go out and be successful since this population is at a lower abundance. We are also going to be acoustically tagging more rainbow trout, northern pike, and bull trout because we are trying to gain a better and more complete understanding of how these apex predators are moving throughout the system. And finally, I just wanted to remind everyone that we do have a University of Idaho graduate study going on walleye food habits, and that is slated to wrap up this summer. So we will get back to you on what this study has learned once we have the evaluation in hand and it comes to a completion. And with that, this wraps up my portion of the presentation and I will turn it over back over to Ken Balance for his updates. Hi there, my name is Ken Bowens. I oversee the Avista Mitigation Program for the Idaho Department of Fish and Game. In the, late in the late 1990s, Avista employed an alternative relicensing process for the Cabinet Gorge and Knox and Rapid Dams. They gathered together interested agencies, tribes, and NGOs to negotiate the terms of an operating license for the next 45 years. The Clark Fork Settlement Agreement, or the CFSA, was the result. This agreement is collaboratively managed by its 27 signatories. It consists of numerous protection, mitigation, and enhancement measures, which are the backbone of the license. Two of these comprise the bulk of the CFSA program for IDF and G. One addresses the operation of the Cabinet Gorge Dam and its associated flow fluctuations. This is mitigated for by providing funding for us to focus on LPO tributary fish habitat enhancement protection and monitoring. Another mitigates for total dissolved gas production of the Knox and Rapids and Cabinet Gorge dams. This provides funding to do good things for fish populations potentially impacted by high TDG in the Clark Fork River, Lake Ponderé, and downstream. The Clark Fork Settlement Agreement translates into several different types of work being performed on the ground by IDF&G and our partners. We perform fish habitat improvement projects on Lake Ponderay tributaries to, to enhance fisheries production where we can. The CFSA also supports or partially supports fisheries management programs such as predator suppression, as well as research and monitoring programs to inform and evaluate our habitat and fisheries management work. Drew Ransom is our biologist focused on CFSA fishery monitoring. A component of my program also involves land acquisition, conservation, and management. The CFSA also wholly supports an IDF&G education and enforcement officer, Dustin Mason, dedicated to Lake Ponderé and its tributaries. Today I'll talk about a fish habitat project we completed last summer. 
Around 2014 through 2016, I noticed a declining trend in bull trout red counts in Trestle Creek, which really wasn't necessarily reflected in other streams. Although red numbers were still robust compared to other tributaries, something was acting differently in Trestle Creek. For numerous reasons I won't go into here, I determined that young of the year fry habitat was likely the issue. Young of the year fish like to live in slow side channels and on stream margins. It appeared to me that in many locations, Trestle Creek was scouring downward instead of laterally during high flows. It was in fact ditching itself and becoming disconnected from its floodplain and remo reducing the amount of slow, shallow water habitat available. At about the same time, I learned the federal highways in Bonner County were planning on doing some improvements to Trestle Creek Road. I took the opportunity to work with them to improve fish habitat in Trestle Creek, while at the same time limiting impacts caused by road construction. We identified three locations where the stream was right next to the road that would likely be impacted by the road work. In effect, we prepped the stream for the road construction that will be done in a couple years. We diverted the flow off the road prison, spread the water out, and added wood and roughness to prevent erosion, but more importantly, to provide the type of habitat we feel is lacking. We developed a memorandum of understanding with Federal Highways, which allowed them to use our project as match for their funding, which is important, because in exchange, they preser will preserve our work, which will allow us and our fish habitat engineer to serve on the design team as they move forward with their plans. These photos show one of the three locations. It's difficult to capture the scope of what we did in still photos, but Dustin Mason, our LPO education officer, put together a great six minute video of the project that really captures it well. And I highly recommend watching it if you haven't already. Our plans for this summer is to continue working in Trestle Creek. We performed a habitat assessment project several years ago that identified areas in the lower reaches of Trestle Creek as lacking in complexity. We're lucky because VISTA has acquired a good amount of property in this area for native fish conservation purposes, so we don't have issues getting landowner permission to do the work. The photo on the screen shows, shows the situation that we're dealing with. The banks are relatively stable in these maturing cedar bottoms, and during high flows, the stream scours downwards, not laterally. The smaller gravels are washed away, leaving large material behind. Also, any trees that do fall over typically don't come in contact with the stream bed. Our approach will be to simply cut these bridge trees, allowing them to fall into the stream and form log jams on their own, which will then retain gravels, reduce flow velocity, and promote lateral scour and floodplain connectivity. This is all a way to create more complex habitat, which we believe is limiting salmonid production in Trestle Creek. The Cabinet Gorge Dam, which is located in Idaho, right inside the Montana-Idaho border, was completed around 1950. Free fish passage into Montana has been blocked ever since. Avista and Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks have been implementing a trap and haul program for bull trout since 2001, and we have also been experimentally passing West Slope Cutthroat above the dam since 2015. We've been using boat electrofishing electro to capture these fish, but starting this spring, a new capture facility at Cabinet Gorge Dam will be online. Fish will be caught in this trap, trucked to a sorting facility at Cabinet Gorge Hatchery, and then bull trout and West Slope Cutthroat trout will be hauled into Montana to reach upstream spawning and rearing habitat. The other species will be released back into the river. We do know that downstream survival of both juveniles and adults through the dam is high, and the expectation is these fish and their offspring will return to Idaho to contribute to the Idaho fishery. So just to give an idea of, the idea of scale, um, the, red area, the red arrow points to a person standing on top of the trap, so this thing's pretty large. Um, it's, it's pretty impressive to see. I also wanted to briefly touch on some of the ongoing research we're doing. We've been collecting fish abundance and biological data from 25 LPO tributary, tributaries since about 2010. Using standardized stream electrofishing techniques, we sample five streams a year and sample each stream every fifth year. We're over halfway through our third rotation on, on doing that sampling. I have Drew Ransom, our biologist, is working on summarizing these results for the first two rotations, so stay tuned for an update on this project. This slide describes some other long-term research my program has been conducting that might be of interest. We've been collecting mark recapture abundance data on salmonids in the Clark Fork River since 1999. These figures show abundance estimates for West Slope cutthroat trout, rainbow trout, combined with West Slope rainbow hybrids, brown trout, and mountain whitefish over time. Please note that the y-axis scales differ for each species. 
although, there, although there's quite a bit of uncertainty in our estimates, as shown by the large 95% error bars, uh, the abundance of trout species appear to have been steady or increasing over the last 20 years or so, while the number of mountain whitefish appear to have been decreasing. We recognize there's a lot going on here and many things might have changed over this time, and Drew's working on taking a more comprehensive look at these data. Regardless, with West Slope Cutthroat Passage over Cabinet on the horizon, we're in a good position to evaluate the effectiveness of that program. The CFSA Land Conservation Program is something that's always kind of chugging along in the background. When opportunities present themselves, we work with willing landowners to either purchase or place conservation easements on properties that have a direct connection to high-value LPO tributaries. So far, we've conserved over 1,200 acres and 7.1 miles of stream banks, mainly in the Trestle Creek, Granite Creek, Gold Creek, and Pack River watersheds. Purchased properties are co-managed by IDFNG and Avista under the conservation spirit of the CFSA. And unless there's, our, unless there's special circumstances, the majority are open to public access. The Twin Creek property is a good example of this. I also want to point out that along with the ownership of these properties comes the responsibility to manage them. The CFSA provides funding for enforcement staff to patrol the areas and also for our wildlife habitat staff to do vegetation management and upland enhan uh, habitat enhancement when appropriate. The CFSA provides us the ability to have a dedicated education and enforcement program. Dustin Mason's our, our officer uh, running this program. We also work with Trout Unlimited, the Pack River Watershed Council, and the Bonner County Water Festival to spread the message of native salmon and conservation and ponderay management. In the three uh, short years Dustin's been in this position, he's taken the program to the next level. Beyond the usual classroom and field trips, he's also used his graphic design skills to develop several ponderay specific handouts and other materials. He's also really skilled in video production and has put together several videos, and he even won a major award at the UI Film Festival. His big accomplishment this year was to design and build an educational trailer that will act as a self-contained mobile classroom. So look for that at a boat launch near you. We've covered a lot of ground up to this point in the presentation, so I want to try to wrap things up by giving you sort of a high-level overview of the fishery status. You can think of these as some of the take-home messages from the information that we've shared already today. For starters, the kokanee population is being sustained at a high level, and this is not only providing an abundant food source for a variety of predator species, but it's also providing popular recreational fishing opportunity. We're seeing the lake trout population remain at low density thanks to the successful suppression program that's been in place. And we're also seeing a strong rainbow trout population that's benefited from having a sustained, abundant kokanee population back in the lake. This is again providing some of the best trophy angling opportunity that we've seen for rainbows in decades. The bull trout population remains strong. Again, these are fish that are benefiting from having an abundant kokanee population and also are benefiting from having fewer lake trout in the system. One thing that we have seen start to change is that there's an indication that the mice shrimp population is rebounding following what's been close to a 10 year period of being at much lower density. This is something we'll be watching closely moving forward as it could influence the carrying capacity of kokanee in the system. Cutthroat trout are still prevalent and appear stable in the system. We don't have as good a handle on how many cutthroat are in the system as some other species but the trend monitoring that we are doing suggests that they're stable in the system. Smallmouth bass are continuing to have a very strong population and much like some of the other predators, smallmouth growth rates are really good right now, partly because of the abundant kokanee population, which they also are able to take advantage of when kokanee are abundant. All indications are that we're continuing to manage walleye at a low density suggesting that the suppression efforts thus far have been successful, although we still have to, some work to do to see if we're going to be able to sustain this over the long term. Northern pike have certainly had an increased presence in the system over the last decade. We're trying to get a better handle on exactly what their population trend looks like, 
but the lines of evidence that we do have suggest that this species is trending upward in the system. There are also a variety of other fish species that are contributing to the fishery, such as yellow perch, brown trout, black crappie, and some others. And these are all fish that anglers have opportunity to pursue and provide some fun opportunity, even though they occur at much lower density than many of the other fish species I just mentioned. Collectively, the Lake Ponderay fishery is performing right now at the highest level it has in decades. The trophy potential of the fishery is exceptional thanks to an abundant kokanee population. We have kokanee fishing opportunity that has been popular for a long time and folks are out able to enjoy again. And on top of that, we have the most diverse fishery that we've ever had in Lake Ponderay. And the mixed species fishing opportunity that exists right now is a nice addition to some of the traditional fishing opportunity that's existed in the past. So right now, the trick is, can we sustain this into the future? And a big part of that is if we can continue to manage predation levels on kokanee and have a kokanee population that can continue to support the diversity of predators in the system. Of course, there are other factors that we'll continue to work on as well, but our goal is to sustain the fishery that's now functioning at a really high level. Well, there's going to be a lot of work yet to do to keep the fishery performing at a high level and also look for continued improvements where we can. At a high level, I'd just like to give you an idea where our program is headed in the future. We're going to continue doing a lot of population monitoring and research for a variety of fish species in the lake. Ryan shared a lot of that with you today, but there's more to come, and these are things that we'll continue to do so that we have the information we need to make science-based management decisions. We're going to be continuing the lake trout suppression program that's been ongoing. That's such an important part to maintaining the fishery. And so we'll be continuing netting and the angler incentive program. I would like to point out that although we're maintaining the netting program at its current level of effort, we anticipate being able to reduce the amount of netting effort in several years. Work that we've done suggests that in about five or six years, we're going to be able to significantly scale back on the amount of netting we do for lake trout while still being able to keep them at low density. So I know a lot of anglers are looking forward to having a lesser presence of nets out there. So do we, and so we're gonna continue working toward that. Another important part of the program has been keeping walleye at low density. So we're gonna continue the walleye suppression program. And again, maintain the current level of netting effort, that 15 day netting effort in the spring, as well as the angler incentive program. We'll be repeating a walleye population survey in 2023, and that'll be sort of our next checkpoint to see how the walleye population is doing. And at that point, we're gonna have a better sense for whether we're continuing to keep them at low density or not. And we'll be able to make decisions at that point in terms of how much netting is gonna be necessary moving forward. The big thing that we're gonna be doing this year that we haven't done since the 2014, 2015 time period is an angler creel survey. So I just want to give folks a heads up that you may encounter one of our staff at a boat ramp somewhere out on the lake who wants to do a quick interview to understand what you're fishing for, what you caught. If that's the case, please take just a minute of your time to give them that information. This is going to be really helpful to us managing the fishery moving forward. We'll continue doing things like working in the tributaries as well to provide the habitat that a lot of these fish need to spawn and for juvenile fish to rear. Um, those habitat improvements and protection measures will, be, will continue, as will kokanee stocking. So we typically are stocking close to 5 million kokanee in the lake to supplement the wild population, and that's something that will be ongoing. And then finally, we, continue, we'll, we will continue to manage fishing and boating sites in and around the lake, and we're even looking at some opportunities to improve some of those sites here in the coming year. So look forward to all of those things from the program and certainly these are things that we'll provide some updates on in future State of the Lake meetings. Ultimately, our goal is to provide great fishing opportunity for anglers and I think that's occurring right now on Lake Ponderay. It's been really rewarding to see how many folks are out enjoying the resource and some of the incredible fish that have been caught in the past year. In particular, the trophy component of this fishery is performing at the highest level it has in decades, and that's been appreciated, I know, by many folks. The, some of the photos here just help to illustrate that. The photo on the left is the fish that was nearly 32 pounds caught last fall, 
and is the largest rainbow trout that's been officially weighed in in over 40 years. In addition, there was a new catch and release bull trout record awarded early in 2021 that was unofficially weighed at 31 pounds. This is within a pound of the current world record bull trout that was caught from the lake in the 1940s. So again, these fish just illustrate the quality of the trophy fishery that's out there right now. And I can tell you that there is not another lake anywhere on the planet right now that can rival the top end fish in terms of rainbow trout and bull trout that are coming out of Lake Ponderay. The cool thing is that there's also diversity to the fishery. We not only have some of the traditional opportunity like a popular kokanee fishery that folks are enjoying, but there's also incredible warm water fishing opportunity for species like smallmouth bass, and even though we're managing against species like northern pike and walleye, there is still fishing opportunity for those fish. There's some amazing fish that are coming out of the lake and some really outstanding angling opportunity that, that anglers are able to enjoy. So collectively, it's a fun time. It's a great time to get out and enjoy the Lake Ponderay fishery, and I'd encourage you to do that. I'll bring this presentation to the finish line with just a few really quick updates. The first is a reminder that the new 2022 through 2024 fishing regulations are now in effect. You can pick up your rule booklet at our office or other licensed vendors. These rules are also available on our website. A couple of changes to be aware of that apply to Lake Ponderay. First, there's a new boundary that defines the lake and the Ponderay River. Previously, this had been the railroad bridge and we've moved that so that it's now the long bridge or the Highway 95 bridge going into Sandpoint. The primary reason for this is that a second railroad bridge is being constructed and it's going to make for a bit of an ambiguous boundary. By moving this, what it also does allow for though is a little extra water that anglers control with unlimited rods between the railroad bridge and the long bridge. The other change is that we've eliminated the closures at the mouth of Gold, North Gold, Granite, and Trestle Creeks. Previously, there was a 100-yard closure in front of the mouths of these streams to protect cutthroat trout and bull trout. And this rule goes back to when there were still harvest fisheries in place for both those species. Now that we manage these species under catch and release rules, those protections aren't necessary. And there's now also opportunity to fish for other species in those areas, and so we wanted to remove that closure. Both of these rule changes were made with really high levels of angler support. I'd like to wrap things up by letting you know where to look for information about the Lake Ponderay fishery. On the Idaho Fish and Game website, we have a page devoted to Lake Ponderay. This is now the clearinghouse for all information that we put out, not just in the coming year, but it also has an archive of information from previous years. The web address is shown here at the top, or you can go to our website and go to the search window and type in Lake Ponderay Fisheries. Once on this page, you'll find past articles that we've written about the fishery. It's also the location where the video you're watching right now has been posted, as well as the link for the upcoming virtual public meeting on April 5th, videos and other information that we produce. So periodically check on this page to find information that we may put out throughout the year. Another source of information, especially for social media users, is the Idaho Fish and Game Panhandle Region Facebook page. This Facebook page has information about all topics in the Panhandle Region, not just Lake Ponderay, but we certainly post information about Lake Ponderay on our Facebook page. This will be the same information you can find on the Lake Ponderay Fisheries webpage, but it can be a handy way to track information and some of the new things that we put out if you like using Facebook. That concludes the 2022 Lake Ponderay State of the Lake meeting. We'd like to thank you for watching, but we'd also like to encourage you to please submit questions you may have online in advance of our live virtual meeting on April 5th. You can also submit questions during the live meeting. We hope you stay engaged, participate in the upcoming virtual meeting so that we can better answer questions you may have that weren't covered in the presentation tonight. Again, Thank you for watching.